Welcome to the Ames Public Library, both in person and virtually, for Paddling with Plants and Critters, a program brought to you through a partnership with the Ames Public Library and Outdoor Alliance of Story County. I'm Clelia Sweeney, an adult services librarian here at Ames Public Library. The library's mission is to connect you to the world of ideas, which we do through diverse and inclusive resources and programming like tonight's event. For those of you with us in person, this room is equipped with an induction loop for the benefit of hearing aid users. To use, please switch your hearing aid to T. We also have a hearing assist device we can lend you for the evening. Please let me know if you're interested in using this. For those of you with us virtually, please submit questions via the chat function, which you should find a link to at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitor monitoring the chat to make sure your questions get shared with our speaker when appropriate. There will also be some time for questions at the end of the session. If you get bumped out of the Zoom meeting, please follow the original link to get back to us. You'll be able to get right back in. And for all participants, today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the Ames Public Library's YouTube channel after the event. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you're on Zoom, your questions will be read by a library staff member. If you're with us live, a staff member will come around with a microphone for you to ask your question, or sorry, rather Bruce, Bruce will come around and ask you, you, you can ask your question. So with that, I'll hand things off to our MC for tonight, Bruce White. Thanks, Cecilia. And welcome everyone to our second winter presentation for, sponsored by the Outdoor Alliance of Story County, as well as partners from the Story County Conservation and the Ames Public Library. Uh, appreciate you, this quite a crowd, and uh, I know that you're sacrificing a lot for not staying home and watching the State of the Union address, but uh, you may have it on your DVR. But uh, Jim's gonna talk about our state of our Iowa rivers. I think that's gonna be a little more exciting, I think, so. Uh, this evening's program will feature Jim and about his title, as you see on the screen. This is also the annual meeting for the Outdoor Alliance of Story County. And uh, when Jim is done, we've had some question and answers from his presentation. We'll turn it over to Diane Burt, who is the president of the Outdoor Alliance of Story County. I'll give a little bit of an overview of uh, uh, some of the activities that our organization has been involved with over the past year. Uh, we're a 501c3, and she'll go into all of that later on of some of the things that we've been working on. And Cecilia already went over most of the housekeeping items that I had, so I won't I'll just dispense with that. I would. Uh, reiterate or reemphasize that when we do get to the Q&A session, uh, please wait for me to get to you with the microphone. That makes it a lot easier for you and here in the room to hear what the question is, but it's very important for the people on Zoom to be able to hear what the question is. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, uh, Jim Pease, uh, Paddling for Plants and Critters and be sharing some of his stories of uh, over the past eight years or so. It's probably longer than that. He's been paddling in here in Iowa, over 2,200 miles of rivers here in Iowa. And uh, I think we're all looking forward to hearing that, that uh, information. Uh, most of you in this room, I'm sure, know Jim probably better than I do in, in some cases. I met Jim, I think, the first time when he was brand new in Iowa back in the 70s. He doesn't, I don't think he remembers me, but I remember him. Um, Jim is now is known throughout Iowa as the wildlife interpreter. He has over 50 years of service as an interpreter, professor of interpretation, writer, and consultant on environmental education projects. Jim helps others to better understand the nature, how nature relates to us, how, and how we can relate to nature in all different kinds of settings. Uh, Jim taught wildlife interpretation to graduate and undergraduate students here at Iowa State University for 24 years. And his research has been on the impact of interpretive and educational strategies. Uh, Dr. Pease also served as an extension wildlife specialist for Iowa, Iowa State for over 20 years. And most recently, Jim was uh, honored by being the recipient for the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation's Higgy Award uh, for all of his contributions he's provided to conservation uh, throughout your, in education and outdoor recreation here in Iowa. So with that, help me welcome Dr. Jim Pease. Thanks, Bruce. We got this mic on now? Cool, all right, very good. Well, thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction. I'm always happy to, to talk to this group and uh, to talk about rivers. 
most of you know me from my wildlife background. And uh, in fact, uh, when Greg asked me to do this talk, uh, uh, it, it occurred to me that when I said, oh, I, want, I haven't done this one before, but I put together a presentation called Paddling for Plants. And he said to me something that indicated what I think many of us paddlers are. We, we tend to be plant blind when it comes uh, to paddling. Uh, we want to see the critters. We'll see deer along the way and turtles, maybe some snakes and things like that. But we tend to kind of just go by the plants. We take them for granted. So I thought it'd be fun to, to talk a little bit tonight about uh, about plants as we paddle along the rivers. As Bruce said, I've, I've paddled about 2,200 plus miles of, of Iowa rivers over the last decade for the water trails program. And it's really been an incredible privilege, really. Um, they, uh, uh, you know, I, I grew up paddling in southeastern Iowa as a, as a child. Uh, uh, we bought our first canoe when, when I was in seventh grade, my older brother and I bought it, and we paddled all the rivers that come into the, the Mississippi there in southeastern Iowa. And uh, it was, it, you know, it was like re redoing that all over my childhood all over again, being able to paddle rivers all over the state and to stay in some state and county parks that we would probably have never seen uh, without the, the opportunity. So as you paddle along, we've gotten to, uh, you have to know how to read the landscape. And that's why I subtitled this reading landscape, because that's in, in fact what you do. You're looking for eagles' nests, you're looking for turtles, you're looking for plants along the way, you're trying to typify what the, uh, 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 what, what, what the forest looks like or the prairie that's along the, the, the river. And it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it keeps you quite busy. So I've got, I paddle along with a, a little digital recorder uh, on my life vest. Uh, I've got my camera, I've got my GPS unit to uh, uh, mark things along the way. And uh, with that, I've, I've uh, uh, spent uh, uh, many, many hours uh, paddling the rivers and, and really getting to know Iowa better than I think I've ever known it. The results of that, though, the really nice thing about it, and I, I come back and I write, it takes as much time writing as it does paddling. And uh, the, the results of that, though, are now available for the public. There are now over 20 of these um, that come out of the reports that I've written for the Iowa DNR Water Trails Program. <clears throat> and you can, you can get paper copies. I've, I've put some of the ones I don't have, I don't even, I've discovered that I've ran out of the Skunk River ones. I don't, <laughs> I don't have any Skunk R River ones with me tonight. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are now 20 of them for around the state. And you can get paper copies or you can download them. Uh, and the downloadable versions are a little longer. You can't put as much, uh, uh, writing uh, on the on the paper versions, uh, but uh, there's a lot more about the 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 various uh, stretches of the river uh, on the downloadable version, and more about some of the critters and plants along the way too. So uh, feel free to take a look at these if you haven't uh, already. Now we'll get this to work, hopefully. <laughs> it says. Uh, uh, what you may uh, what may you see along the river? Well, one of the things is it depends on a number of things. Depends on how fast you paddle. If you're really into it, to getting it done, to sort of doing the river, then you're not going to see a whole lot along the way. Uh, and it depends certainly how quiet you are. When I paddle the rivers, I mainly paddle alone, and it's quite wonderful because even though I'm talking to myself a little bit into my microphone or my, my little digital recorder, um, uh, if you have other paddlers with you, uh, you tend to talk about along the way. And of course that alerts everything down the river because that water carries the sound very, very well. And uh, uh, so it depends how many boats and how many paddlers are with you and really how hard you look. Um, it also depends on what river you on. Uh, one of my favorite rivers in the state is uh, the Winnebago uh, up in uh, north of Forest City there. I don't know how many of you have paddled that. Lots of people paddle. Good. Yeah, that's a great river because they have uh, worked with landowners and agencies to restore all the riverine wetlands, the oxbow wetlands and everything along the way. It is teeming with wildlife and teeming with native communities. It's just, just incredible. I uh, really love that river because it shows me what Iowa rivers can be if we worked hard enough at it and uh, got the cooperation of landowners and agencies to do it. Uh, not surprisingly, that's true 
uh, whether you're looking for plants or for animals. To read the landscape, you have to know a little bit about what to expect and where you might look for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But to be able to recognize what you see along the way and uh, obtain some joy, I think, from your observations. Uh, when I started the, the interpretation curriculum in, in the uh, wildlife department at Iowa State um, uh, some years ago now, one of the things that required of the students, they had to take an entomology course in addition. These are, these are animal ecology students, wildlife, wildlife folks, right, Leanne? So, <laughs> and uh, uh, they, they, they're all about the wildlife. And, and one of the other classes I had them take was plant taxonomy. They said, plants, why are we taking plants? And I said, if it wasn't for the plants, you wouldn't have all of these critters. They're the base of the whole food pyramid. You got to know what it is they're eating and, and nesting in and all those things. The, the plants are really, really important. Um, uh, so it's really, really important, I think, to, to take a look along the way. It's kind of like reading a book, but your observations are, are the words. Let's begin in the water what that says up there. So, uh, uh, and, and in the water along the way, there are lots of things uh, that you can see, lots of plants in the water. You might see some of these as smart weeds. Smart weeds are uh, one of the things that you see on the herbicide commercials a lot uh, through the winter. And uh, uh, it's one of the things that we've, we've learned to hate. But it's a, uh, there are lots of species of them, and they're native, and they're very, very uh, important to wildlife. Uh, they have a very high protein and energy level, and it's, it's why wildlife managers will have mud flats in the, in the summertime, and it allows us the, the smartweeds to really uh, uh, pop out of, the, uh, uh, out of the soil, and then they flood it. And so it's right on the, on the, the duck's eye level uh, when the ducks are, 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 are migrating to in the fall. Very high in protein, very high in fat, all the things that they need. Uh, to do the migrations along the way. So another one, uh, arrowhead or Sagittarius. Uh, this is a, a, a wonderful plant also for, uh, um, it grows right in the water. It's an emergent uh, plant along the shoreline and along many of our rivers, if they're healthy enough. Soft stem bulrush is also a hard stem bulrush, but we don't have much of that in the state. It's uh, terrific for holding soil along our rivers. Rivers are flooding, and so we need plants that can hold that soil in there. And it makes wonderful uh, nesting habitat for, uh, uh, for, for lots of things, uh, including um, muskrats and lots of, lots of birds as well. If you know the little ditty, recite along with me. Sedges have edges, and rushes are round, and grasses have nodes wherever they're found, right? <laughs> okay. Sedges have edges. Sedges are one of those emergent plants uh, that will grow anywhere in that, uh, that, that, that the wet zone. Sometimes they can be flooded and they do just fine, but they really like the mud flats uh, uh, in order to spout. This happens to be a Carex sedge, uh, one of the larger ones, a nut sedge. And it's, um, uh, uh, again, very, very important food supply for all kinds of things, as well as has terrific uh, um, uh, soil holding uh, roots. Weed is that floating plant that you see all over lots and lots of uh, farm ponds. It does very, very well with high nitrogen levels. We have lots of lakes and ponds with high nitrogen levels, and so it does very well. It's also food for dabbling duck. This is a cool plant because uh, I, I guess it can flower, but it doesn't reproduce that way. It reproduces by dividing, constantly dividing. That's why if you have a pond that you watch all summer, it keeps getting there's more and more and more of it. It doubles uh, every few days, and uh, uh, it really, really covers the surface. Uh, it, uh, it also hides lots and lots of little critters underneath it. Lots and lots of um, uh, 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 protozoans and, and uh, 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 insects, all kinds of things are in that, that shady area right underneath the duckweed. Its roots hang down into the water. It is smaller, oh, let's see. Uh, each of these leaves here is about maybe an eighth of an inch in diameter. So it's really a tiny plant, but uh, really covers the surface uh, uh, really, really well. And if you're very lucky, yeah, I had to throw in a few critter slides uh, as well, uh, and very quiet, you get to see some of these critters. Uh, uh, otters in the lower right hand, 
Uh, otters have, have you know, it's, it's fun. I think of thinking about this, I'm doing a, a radio program on Thursday morning with, with Charity, and I was thinking about, we're going to be talking about the waterfowl uh, that we see through the winter. And uh, I was thinking about all the things that I didn't see as a kid that I can see today. Growing up in southeastern Iowa in the 50s and 60s, otters were not present. Uh, uh, they were gone. They were extirpated from the state. Uh, we saw muskrats and muskrat houses, but no otters. Uh, we saw uh, no swans. Uh, uh, the only bald eagles we saw were in the wintertime, uh, never in the summertime, and they were fishing in the open water below, below uh, uh, one of the dams. Uh, it, it's pretty neat to be able to see them now. But if you're a paddler, you rarely see them. Uh, unless you really know where to look, it is uh, tough to see them along the way. Great blue herons are sort of ubiquitous in the state and all of our rivers and streams and ponds. Uh, as long as there are fish in them, they, they will do it. I love it when the river goes down because uh, I've watched herons Great blue herons stand around uh, the river that is now a pool, and all the fish are right in that pool, and they're cleaning up. You know, it's like uh, 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 shooting shooting a fish in a, in a in a bucket for them. And the muskrats, uh, muskrats are, uh, are 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 quite. This is actually the muskrat picture is along the Winnebago River, and they were I saw dozens of them that day. It was amazing. They were collecting all the sedges along the edges. Um, you might sneak up on one of these ancient critters, uh, the uh, the turtle on the fence post uh, uh, idea. This is a log that he crawled up on it. It was slanted in the water, but he was sound asleep, and I was able to paddle within about 10 feet of him before he woke up and tried to scramble to get off the log. It was really, really a, a, a amazing. Uh, Soft-shelled turtles, painted turtles, uh, uh, very, very common, and uh, snapping turtles in our rivers. You have to be quiet to see them because uh, they'll be basking along in these rocks or on the shoreline. And as soon as I round the corner, oftentimes, unless they're sound asleep like the snapping turtle was, they dive right into the water if they see any movement upstream. So you got to be quiet. And and uh, they would never, I would never even see them dive into the water if I was noisy because they would hear me long before that. Typically, just along the shoreline, there are lots of plants just out of the water along the way. This is one of my favorites. This is down at Chichaqua, by the way, uh, where this photo was taken. Um, this is cardinal flower, or lobelia. Uh, this is a wild lobelia, and uh, they're really spectacular. Uh, in, in the woods, when they're all in bloom along the edge of the, uh, the creek down there, it is, it is amazing. Uh, it's these red spikes coming up uh, all over the place. Um, uh, another uh, favorite plant, but recognize this, not the not the uh, the fuzzy ones, but the straight up and down ones. What'd you call it? Horsetail, equisetum. What'd you call it? Snake plant. Snake plant. Okay, that's another one. Scouring rush. Chinese puzzle. Chinese puzzle, puzzle plant. Yeah, we used to call it uh, joint grass. And then the 60s came along. We couldn't call it that anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, lots and lots of names for this. It's an ancient, ancient plant. Um, uh, whoops, sorry, wrong one. All right, maybe I can get this right. Uh, it, it, it really has uh, no conductive tissue. So it transfers water from top to bottom. So if you use Roundup on it, it doesn't take it down into the roots because it doesn't conduct uh, down into the roots at all. Uh, it, it uses osmotic pressure uh, in order to get water uh, up. Uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful little plant. Not many things eat this, uh, but if you're trying to get through it, if, or if you're, you're hiding, it's a great place to hide because it's very hard to walk through. It has lots of silicates in it. So if you're trying to, uh, which is why it's called scouring rush, if you've ever tried to clean your pans out camping, you can take one of these and, and it has vertical uh, lines in it and you there's silicates and you can scrub with, uh, with, with some of this uh, equisetum. Ah, another one that is right along the shoreline, uh, sometimes standing in water, but mostly just out of the water is wild iris or blue flag, really a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Uh, uh, all of our, our irises are domestic irises, I think, 
Um, yeah, they, they might be pretty and nice and everything. I like irises, but I really like the wild ones. The blue flag is just, just spectacular uh, uh, along our streams. Um, another one you commonly see just out of the water is another another one of the um, uh, the milkweeds. And I don't know if you've ever taken a look at a milkweed flower, but it doesn't matter whether it's world milk milkweed in a prairie, common milkweed on a roadside, um, uh, swamp milkweed, like a, which is what this is. Uh, you can't see the title up there. <laughs> swamp milkweed. Uh, but uh, they all have, the flowers are all the same. And uh, you, if you take a close look at them, they're really spectacular. They have all the, the sepals are all down and then the petals are formed into little cups up here, five little cups that hold the nectar. And so the butterfly or the beetle or any of the pollinators have to stand right on the sexual parts of the flower in order to get the nectar. Very smart plant. Plants have figured out uh, how to make other animals, including us, do exactly what they want us to do. And uh, they've, they've figured that out along the way. Michael Pollan said that. He said, we've spread potatoes all over the world, which is exactly what potatoes wanted us to do. <laughs> so, so pretty, pretty amazing. Um, uh, the ever-present, ever-ready reed canary grass, uh, Phalaris, uh, is, is very often forms nothing but uh, almost monocultures. But when it's in its natural habitat, it's mixed in with other things. You can see some Sagittarius in here. You can see a little thistle. You see a little bit of brome, you know. Uh, it, 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 it's a decent plant uh, along the shoreline. And then our friend, stinging nettle, which is always seems to be where you want to get out of the boat, right? <laughs> uh, you, you, you want to get out right there, and then you realize, oh, I'm getting out right into stinging nettle. Growing up as kids, uh, we, we paddled an island south of Burlington. It was a five-mile-long island. And uh, I, I haven't been back since I was a kid, but I, I plan to be uh, soon. And uh, that island had all kinds of sloughs and ponds back in there. We knew where the pileated woodpecker nests were. We knew where the heron uh, rookery or the heronry was. And uh, uh, the, the, we, we seldom got out except to camp. Um, and when we camped, we had to clear the area of nettles and poison ivy. <laughs> they were, they're often together. And... Uh, it was uh, it was quite quite uh, uh, quite fun because you really get those wounds opened up and scratch and you know it, it's it's good that way. Um, <laughs> right along the shoreline, there are a number of shrubs, a number of shrubs that uh, are cool. And this is one I don't think many people have seen. This is called button bush or uh, cephalanthus. Cephalanthus is the genus, and uh, it it's not a common shrub but it is common along our rivers. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's everywhere, but where you find it, you find uh, quite a lot of things. It's, it's what it looks like in bloom, a little white flower, and uh, it goes from that to the, the, the fruiting bodies down here uh, rather quickly. And the shrub can be, oh, six, eight feet high in, in some areas, uh, but it's very, very tolerant of having its feet wet uh, in the water. Another one you commonly see is uh, dogwood, uh, and there are several species of dogwoods. The most common one along the shoreline is a red osier dogwood. Again, it's tolerant of having its feet uh, in the, its roots in the water. And you can tell it's a dogwood by two things. Number one, uh, the leaves, all the veins, if you look at this leaf, the veins all curve towards the tip. Okay, dogwoods always curve towards the tip. And it's opposite in branching, okay? It's not alternate, it's opposite, okay? So uh, uh, you can tell the dogwoods. And this is one of several species of dogwoods. The most common one along our rivers and, and ponds is the one, the red osier, which doesn't, doesn't mind uh, having wet roots. And these are the little doll's eye uh, fruits on it. They're quite persistent. They hang on there well into the fall. So some plants are, are preferred plants for birds to eat the berries right away, the raspberries, the, the service berries, the, they want to eat those right away because they're so delicious. And then they've, they've got these that hang on into the fall, they're a little more persistent. And then some shrubs hang on clear into the winter. I've got, still have fruits on our high bush cranberry. 
They're apparently so bitter. They don't like them until they're frozen. And then it's late in the winter when we get days like today and tomorrow, they begin to ferment a little bit. Then they'll eat them. <laughs> Maybe they know something we don't, I don't know. Um, uh, weeds have a, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Weeds have a, uh, I have to remember what I wrote here, uh, have, a, have a special place in pioneering along the shoreline. These are all plants that uh, take advantage of the, the ups and downs of rivers. And as they go down, they, they take advantage real quickly of the water that's available and they sprout and uh, provide us lots and lots of things. Here's a, a wall of giant ragweed, giant ragweed. Uh, but uh, again, it's another one of those plants we learn to, to dislike. Ragweed, oh, it has that terrible, gives you uh, sinus uh, problems in the fall of the year. It's the pollen that does that. The seeds are fantastic uh, for wildlife, very high in protein, high in fat. Uh, uh, they have something like 24% protein in those seeds. Very high protein uh, for a for, uh, uh, plant and uh, really uh, uh, well loved by all kinds of uh, uh, birds. This one, not so much. Um, after a flood, the cockovers will often, this happens to be up on the, uh, just off the Big Sioux in Northwestern Iowa. Uh, they populate the mud flats. And when you walk through them, your pants, your socks, your, the hair on your legs, if you're wearing shorts, <laughs> and anything else will uh, uh, get these little little hooks uh, from these uh, cockaburs into you and the fur of deer and raccoons and everything else as well to spread them around. Again, we're doing just what the plants want us to do. Another uh, a plant that uh, we've learned to dislike uh, is bitens, uh, stick tights. Those little forked uh, seeds that get into your socks as well and uh, sometimes work their way into your dog's uh, uh, fur. But uh, in flower, they're quite beautiful, and they serve a wonderful purpose in this, in this uh, uh, lower uh, wetland areas because they, uh, uh, you can see it here, this is um, reed's canary on the side, uh, uh, and, and there's some nettles over there too. <laughs> so uh, it, it, a wonderful purpose of, of, of uh, uh, providing uh, some seeds uh, for, for wildlife species as well. Another uh, real common uh, weedy plant is Rumex or Doc. Uh, and uh, again, it has very high protein uh, uh, seeds. Here's some, at, when it goes to seed, this reddish seed you see along there is, is uh, uh, Doc. It's in here with uh, a little bit of uh, evening primrose, um, bear's tail, some foxtail and other things. I think this is the Des Moines River Flats just above uh, Sailorville or just below the um, uh, Highway 210 there. So I think Cindy took this, right? Probably, okay. <laughs> uh, along many rivers, uh, there are cliffs, rock outcrops of either limestone or sandstone, and they serve as a, as a wonderful base for all kinds of kind of rare plants, as a matter of fact plants that you don't see otherwise. And so you have the privilege as you're paddling along, not only to see these high cliffs, but they provide the microclimates that are necessary for a whole suite of other plants uh, that actually begin the whole process of breaking it down. Uh, you have things like lichens up here, those, uh, those uh, kind of light green colored lichens up here. They give off an acid, many, uh, many lichens give off an acid, which tends to break down the sandstones or the limestones that falls down, collects in cracks below or on, on little crevices, and other things like um, uh, uh, mossens and liverworts and ferns, as well as some flowering plants can, can begin to grow there. Um, here's a lichen that you don't see very often. And lichens, by the way, are actually two plants. It's a, a fungus and an algae, and you can remember that because Franny Fungus kind of took a, a, a lichen to Annie, uh, 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 Alan Algae. So, okay, so it's two plants in one. Two, two, two plants. <laughs> okay. so, uh, so this is called rock tripe. This is about, oh, three to four inches across. Three to four inches across. And this one might be somewhere between two and 300 years old. The reason we know that is it grows in a very narrow range of temperature and humidity. It has to be just right for that plant to grow at all. So it, it grows very, very slowly. Um, they are edible, but you've got to be really hungry. 
uh, especially uh, uh, they, they don't taste all that good. And uh, you're, you're eating something that's spent two to 300 years uh, growing there. So um, uh, it's pretty amazing. This is um, a, a liverwort, not liverwurst. Okay, that's a, that's a different thing. But liverworts, they grow only when it's very, very cool and very, very wet. Often where the seeps come out of the side of the cliff. Uh, and, and often on north-facing slopes of, of those cliffs that are growing there. And water is often uh, dripping out of them. It has, it has uh, by the way, it looks like a, almost a, an alligator skin to it, a little, little fine little, uh, little skin to it. Pretty, pretty neat little plant. Um, uh, then when there's enough, enough soil, other things will take root from cliff break ferns here to harebells, uh, all kinds of things will, uh, the mosses below. Sometime the columbine will, will hang off the edge of the, uh, the, the cliff as well because there's enough soil that has been created by the plants that came before for them to grow there. So, um, and you can read the landscape uh, of, of rivers as you paddle along. This one is obviously a prairie river. This is the Little Sioux right up in the northwest uh, uh, border of the state and uh, where it begins uh, in Iowa. And uh, a, a small little river, beautiful, and it's paddling through prairie. I really love paddling. And most of our rivers uh, that uh, I'm accustomed to, and most of the rivers in the state are lined with woodlands, uh, as we, particularly as we've gotten rid of, uh, of fire, uh, and more and more woodlands have grown up. But up there, it's still prairie along the way. It's pretty neat. So there are lots of prairie species uh, as well. Lots of um, uh, asters here, two different kinds of asters. Uh, butterfly milkweed, notice that milkweed flower again. It's the same structure as that swamp milkweed we saw earlier, uh, but uh, uh, really quite quite beautiful. This has become a popular garden plant, of course, but uh, it's, it's other things as well. This is um, a, a painted lady on a um, uh, salvia, uh, uh, what, blue, blue what? Blue, blue something, I can't remember the common name. Uh, salvia is a genus anyway. Uh, and again, it's a prairie plant right along right along the uh, the rivers, uh, and and prairie species tend to persist even in little openings where you don't have prairie, but you might have an opening in the woodland along the way. You get some prairie species coming up, including this uh, eastern kingbird that uses these sunflowers as a perch. Uh, uh, and before it, uh, 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 these are actually I think cup plant. Um, uh, it uses it as a perch to fly out and gather insects. And the, here are turkeys, appropriately, in turkey foot grass or big blue stem uh, all, along one of the rivers. Uh, evening primrose, and then on the right is, a, is another uh, prairie, but wet prairie, likes wet, like, it likes its roots in, in the wetness. It's uh, Spartina or slough grass. Um, I think um, uh, uh, so, some have called it um, it's a rip gut. Ripcut's another another name for it because there's little saw edges along the edge, and if you're going through it, uh, running through it naked, you'll you'll rip your gut up. Okay, so it's, uh, don't do that. Okay, so uh, you might surprise uh, uh, this this doe or some other doe as you round a bend. Again, you got to be quiet, uh, and, and and it's nice to see them because you can see them so readily along a prairie stream. Or you might surprise some of these critters, uh, uh, or they might surprise you, uh, from very large uh, wolf spider uh, on a log here to uh, a northern water snake. And up in the corner, partially covered up there, is uh, a, a, a green heron uh, along the way. Again, depends what you're looking for and who's looking for you along the way. Um, and you can uh, actually change uh, uh, habitats. You can read the landscape of the woodlands as you go along uh, as well. Uh, and here are some typical lowland trees, uh, and it includes things like silver maple and cottonwood and uh, box elder, green and black ash. Um, I, I just had today had three ashes cut down in our on our property that really uh, is, is, is very sad. As I'm paddling on the rivers, I see some of these big black ash and some of these big black ashes along the rivers are huge. They've been growing there for probably several hundred years. And I realize, I know that the next time I come, they're all going to be dead. And it's just, uh, you know, it'll provide apartment houses for all kinds of critters for a long time. But uh, it's sad to see those 
those big old giants uh, 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 die. Uh, the nice thing is, is that uh, we have a, quite a variety of things along our rivers uh, and, and diversity, just as in the human population, I think, uh, we need to, to learn from the, 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 the natural population. Where there's diversity, there's strength. Um, it, it doesn't provide weakness, it provides strength. And, and it's certainly in our woodlands, uh, we, we, we see that. So a few species can tolerate having their feet wet, and silver maple is one of them. Silver maples are, are very common along our, our, uh, our rivers, and you'll see this multiple stem. Uh, 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 they, they, they do that uh, for, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one is, and here you can see the, uh, uh, this is a flooded understory, and the flood is gone now, and what's left underneath? It's absolutely, there doesn't seem to be anything other than silver maple underneath it. Maples provide a tremendous shade, so not a lot of things can get through, plus you have all this accumulated wood underneath. But here's one of the reasons you see multiple stems. They put up prodigious numbers of seeds, and uh, those seeds then uh, tend to all sprout at once and uh, very close to one another, and so they'll hold that soil right next to the river and sort of claim that uh, for themselves. That's why you see all of these, these small silver maples here that have all come from those seeds. Sure, they'll all come, some all compete the others, but many of them obviously survive in that wet uh, habitat. Cottonwoods are another one, put out lots and lots of seeds, and they grow very fast, and they grow very large. And uh, they provide an important, uh, uh, in fact, if you look closely at this tree right in here, uh -huh. Uh, of all the trees that uh, uh, bald eagles nested in Iowa, cottonwood is by far the most common tree. I've seen them in, I've seen one nest in a hackberry, a few in, in white pines, but uh, I would say 95% of the other ones that I've, I've found along the way uh, are all in cottonwoods. Uh, they're big trees, they're pretty strong for a while at least, uh, but they provide uh, a wonderful nesting habitat. Here's a uh, a brancher, he's out there thinking about trying his wings out on the edge of the on the edge of the uh, uh, the, the nest there. Um, and um, uh, another species that is common, especially in the southeastern half, maybe southeastern third of the state, is uh, one called river birch. Uh, river birches are also multiple stems. They're right on the river bottom, often right next to the shoreline as you paddle along. And uh, uh, they're, they're relatives, certainly, of the betula, of the, of the white birch, but they have this, uh, this beautiful sort of uh, orangey brown color, yellows in some cases, uh, but the, the peeling bark is, uh, is very typical uh, of them. Um, here's a, a, a river birch in fruit. They have these little, almost cone-like, tiny little, about the size of your, your little fingernail there. Uh, uh, that, that produce cone-like structure that produces seeds from them. The thing about all of these, uh, river birches, cottonwoods, and silver maples, is that they all are very fast growing and very soft wood. From a wildlife standpoint, that's really important because they rot quickly. And they provide homes for all kinds of things, from raccoons and possums to turkey vultures to uh, uh, mice to bats, uh, all kinds of things that will live inside these, uh, these hollow rotting uh, 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 cavities. Owls, uh, squirrels, even prothonotary warblers. This is the one warbler we have. It can't drill its own, so it has to use uh, either rotting stems or, or, or uh, holes that other birds have made for them. Uh, it's our one warbler that actually is a cavity nester, and you'll see them and hear them uh, along, along our rivers. Another really important uh, uh, Riverside, and in fact, I think it's increasingly uh, important are the willows. They're very, very adaptable. They're very strong, and they're very flexible. They bend in the water and don't break. Uh, when the floods rise, uh, this, uh, what I call the willow wedge, here does very, very well. The oldest willows are in the back. The, the daughters and sons of those grandfather willows or grandmother willows are here. And then the next ones, and these are the young ones. These are the young of the year, just uh, uh, right along the shoreline. They keep reaching out, putting new, uh, new roots out and sprouting. Uh, they form this sort of wedge-shaped uh, uh, wall, the willow wedge wall, 
the real red wall <laughs> along, the, along the shoreline. And uh, I think it's nothing uh, is superior to the holding capacity of those roots to claim that beach, to hold that soil, even in, in, uh, in heavy floods. Um, uh, here's here's a, a, some out in the water right here that have uh, uh, withstood the flood, the floodwaters, and uh, they continue to hold uh, uh, that, that, that shoreline. Um, uh, really superior to all kinds of things. And one of the nice things is, uh, plus they're, they're loved by beavers and uh, a number of other uh, uh, species, but uh, you can see beavers have, have chewed on this one. You can see the teeth marks in it. Uh, they use them for homes. Uh, they pile uh, our, our beavers along our rivers. Our, our, they don't build lodges. They dig holes into the bank that open underwater. And then uh, our, our, uh, up on the bank, uh, 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 inside, uh, up higher out of the water. Uh, but they pile all these, these willows in the front of them. Here's a slide where they, they have brought them down from above. And they probably, if there was a cornfield just beyond it, they bring corn stalks down too with fresh corn in it. So they, uh, they like to, to, uh, to feed on those. And uh, when they're left behind on the root, as in this, uh, on the beach, if the beaver has cut them and been scared away, they'll take root rather quickly. In just a few days, they'll take root, put out new sprouts. So they're taking advantage of every opportunity, even when the beaver cuts them. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they are providing lots and lots of food for beaver and other, other browsing uh, species. Uh, and those wonderful willow wedges provide perches for uh, uh, some of them, our most beautiful singers along rivers, including uh, song sparrows and uh, 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 yellow throats. On the benches, slightly higher, these are often called secondary benches, it's in the floodplain, a little bit higher so that their roots are not in the water. You'll find a number of things, uh, including all of these species here, that uh, like to call that area home. Um, and sycamores uh, are, are one of my favorites, have always been. In fact, my wife and I planted, we, we pulled one out of, a, out of a beach and planted it in our, my grandmother's yard. And in just a few years, she had a shade tree there. And she always um, marveled at how that stick that we brought in survived <laughs> because they're tough. They're really tough. They've done very, very well. Uh, they're a, a species, uh, it looks like a very large maple shaped leaf, but they're not a maple. Um, and I'll show you why in a minute. They're, they're, they, they are alternate, okay? Whereas maples are opposite, right? Okay, so, uh, but they have a big maple-like leaf and they have this, uh, this wonderful bark. And this time of year, you can trace a, uh, a stream. If you stand, if you go out to, uh, I've done this out at Reactor Woods uh, in, in West Ames, you stand on top of the hill and you can see where the stream goes just by following the white trees, the sycamores along through the woods. You can trace where that stream is so along the way. Try that. Um, uh, they are uh, uh, quite a beautiful tree. Black walnut, of course, comes in lots of shapes and lots of sizes. Uh, this one is, is sort of uh, probably got injured as a, as a child and, and uh, grew multiple stems. Uh, but they're they, uh, uh, wonderful food for all kinds of things and provide uh, uh, excellent, uh, uh, excellent cover for things. Uh, um, this is, it's too bad you can't see this. It, said, it says, mad dogs and bucks have good vibes. <laughs> mad dogs and bucks have good vibes. That, what that tells you is all the common plants that are opposite in arrangement. Maple, ash, dogwood, buckeye, and viburnum. Mad dogs and bucks have good vibes. Okay. <laughs> my uh, my grandson learned that from me when he was just a toddler, and uh, uh, learning how to talk. and And uh, he corrected his high school teacher, <laughs> his biology teacher. He said, "No, mad dogs and bucks have good vibes." And his high school teacher thought he was nuts. Of course. <laughs> he said, oh, "My dad told me." <laughs> uh, so. So this happens to be a, a, a maple. It's opposite in branching, prodigious in seeds. This is a very common in the, in the bench area, as well as slightly lower uh, box elder. So, so it is in the maple group. 
Um, uh, dead and dying elms that grow in that area provide these wonderful apartment houses for all kinds of things. You can see elms continue to die of Dutch elm disease, uh, even though uh, they, uh, uh, the big ones that in our, our towns and cities are all gone. I grew up on a street in Burlington that was lined with a cathedral of American elms. Many of you probably did as well. And uh, in one summer, they were all gone. Just amazing, just uh, a, a, a real shame. And I think we're seeing that now with ash. Uh, the drought last summer really seemed to accelerate uh, the damage from emerald ash borer. And boy, lots of uh, ash died last summer. Just amazing. So, um, but lots of apartment houses, really important for all kinds of things along the way. The primary nesters, uh, the primary cavity nesters, the woodpeckers, they can drill out those holes. But there are all kinds of secondary species that can't drill their own holes that use those uh, from er everything from um, uh, bluebirds and prothonotary warblers uh, to squirrels to uh, um, uh, owls, uh, all kinds of things will, will use those, uh, those holes that the woodpeckers make. This is swamp white oak, perhaps uh, a, uh, a hybrid between bur oak and swamp white oak. Oaks do a lot of hybridization, and it's very hard to tell the difference sometimes. Uh, this one I, I did identify as a, I think this was on the Wapsi, um, uh, but this is a, a big swamp white oak on that bench above. Uh, this tree will um, tells you a lot about the history of the land. This is a native tree. And where you see in a, a woodland, you see one every once in a while. When you're paddling along and you notice the shoreline is like this shoreline is, is lined with this one, you know something about the history of the land if you can read the landscape. This is honey locust, or Gladitsia. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful genus name, Gladitsia. So, uh, and uh, uh, it's the one that uh, is perfect for climbing, uh, <laughs> if you're a little mouse, maybe. Uh, these are uh, the, the big thorns that go through tires and shoes and boots and all kinds of things. Uh, but the seeds, uh, again, very prodigious in, in seed production. Uh, those pods, it's a legume. Uh, those pods uh, are, are food for things like squirrels and mice and everything. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it tells you, what does it tell you about that woodland? It tells you that it's probably been grazed and certainly has been overgrazed because cattle will not eat this plant. Uh, and it uh, uh, when it is a solid uh, shoreline of Glidetsi, you know it's a grazed woodland because uh, it's the thing that comes to dominate. They've eaten the other species, and this is what is left behind. Uh, so you can read that landscape. Another one that is common in in um, pastured areas are mulberries, and I love mulberries. So do lots of birds love them, but uh, cattle don't like them, and uh, as a result, you'll often see them along our rivers, and uh, you don't have to see the tree. Sometimes on a, on a scoured bank like this, you see these orangey roots. Those are all mulberry roots right there. And uh, they've taken advantage of the opening uh, to, to grow there. Um, farther upland, farther upland are uh, lots of other species. The ones that we commonly think of Iowa woodlands along the way, the, the oaks, and there are several different species of oaks, including one I didn't put up here, here in central Iowa along the, the, the uh, uh, Des Moines River will have, um, uh, just went out of my head. Swamp. What? No, no, the swamp is uh, there, but uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a white oak. But uh, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, maples and hickories and basswoods and buckeyes and ironwoods. And, and these are all along only in the upland areas uh, of, of our rivers. The black and red oaks all have these pointed uh, edges to the leaves. So you can know it's either black or red. Blacks tend to have, these are called sinuses, the part between where the points are, okay? And the sinuses on black oak are very deep, okay? So the, uh, the, the leaf almost looks skeletonized as opposed to red oak where that's filled in a little bit more than not as, not as deep. Um, uh, uh, burr oaks and white oaks have rounded leaf edges, not pointed at all. And uh, uh, so you can you can uh, tell the difference. Uh, oh, I almost had it. Was it? 
Chinkapin, thank you. Yeah, Chinkapin. Ah, good for you. <laughs> Chinkapin is the other one I didn't put up there. And it's along the Des Moines River. It's not supposed to be this far north, but it is. It's doing real well, in fact. So uh, it tends to be a, a farther swamp. <clears throat> uh, here along the Wapsie River, there's, um, there's a savanna. And you'll see these big, oops, um, you'll see these, these big oaks along here. And some of them have huge lower branches, or at least scars where those big branches have fallen off. They were clearly open grown in a savanna environment. When fires raged through uh, and, and came into our river valleys along the way. Uh, and, and why has this one been maintained? This has probably been grazed, has continued to be grazed, but only occasionally by cattle. And when they rotationally graze them, you can maintain a savanna uh, so cattle can have a very strong, good purpose in these woods. It hasn't been taken over by honeysuckle or, or uh, a European buckthorn or anything else. Uh, it has actually maintained a prairie underneath it. And uh, uh, savannas were really a creation uh, of herbivory, of animals that ate the plants that were there. If you're a big, dark beast, heavy beast uh, on an August day, a uh, hot August day, where are you heading? You're heading for the trees. It's cooler under there. And while you're there, you're eating along the way. So if you were an elk or a bison, and certainly in eastern Iowa, where savannas were very common, we probably had more elk than we ever had bison. And the elk were browsers as well as grazers. So they ate that, that uh, woody stuff underneath. The stuff that we now, in order to maintain uh, uh, savannas, any of you who have tried to maintain a savanna, you're out there cutting all the woody stuff by hand and uh, trying to, to herbicide it. So, uh, but the, the, they, they created that uh, uh, totally on their own. There's another one, uh, uh, shagbark hickory, beautiful shaggy bark where bats will, will uh, thermoregulate during the day. Uh, at night, when they come back in their early cool of the morning, they might be on the south side underneath that bark. Uh, during the heat of the day, they move around to the north side where it's still in the shade and it's cooler. So they, uh, uh, it's a wonderful uh, 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 tree as well for the, the, uh, the nuts that it provides. But you can see here that the, the bright, light bright green leaves of sugar maple they're overtopping some of the oaks that are in the understory. And what I see happening in Iowa woodlands is this is happening tremendously. Our oak hickory woodlands are being overtopped by more shade tolerant maples. And we're soon going to have maple basswood um, woodlands and very few uh, oak hickory unless they're managed uh, for oak hickory. Uh, sugar maple and basswood are very, very shade tolerant and oaks are certainly not. And uh, they're overtopping them uh, on rivers all over the all over the state. Here's a basswood in flower, and of course, if you're a beekeeper, you love to see basswoods in flower because they lots of produce wonderful uh, nectar, very light um, uh, honey. Um, buckeyes uh, also are seen along uh, rivers. They they add some diversity to the woodland. Uh, they're not common, I would say, but uh, if you look for them, particularly when they're in bloom, you'll see them along the way. But again, you have to look. Um, another tree that's very shade tolerant, often coming up underneath our oak woodlands, is this uh, ironwood or American hopworm reed. Uh, beautiful uh, uh, fruits on it, uh, uh, and strange, often strange uh, sort of growth habit here on the, the, the knobs and the branches on, on, the, on the left. Um, and uh, uh, white pines, are primarily, they are native to Iowa, but primarily in northeastern Iowa only. Uh, where you see them in central Iowa, they've been planted. I can tell, in fact, I was just paddling uh, the upper reaches of um, uh, uh, the, um, um, well, in Sac County, um, <laughs> the raccoon, the north raccoon, and uh, in Sac County, and I saw uh, four white pines. And I knew there was probably a homestead there because they're the only white pines in Sac County, I think. Uh, so there, there were an old homestead there that had since disappeared, but the pines persisted. Uh, this happens to be along the upper Iowa. Um, you often see red cedar or juniper or juniperus. Um, uh, they're very tolerant. Uh, they'll grow in any soil. 
on rocks like this where they're just hanging off the edge of the cliff, hanging on for dear life. And uh, uh, they're, they're providing lots of wonderful cover. Uh, and uh, uh, where fire has been eliminated here, this happens to be along the, uh, the Big Sioux in Western Iowa that should be in the Lust Hills, should be all prairie along there. But fire was eliminated and so the, the cedars have, uh, have taken over. Um, if you paddle at Iowa River, and you read the landscape about it, it'll tell you much about its past, and it'll help you predict the, the future along the way. So it tells you not only what critters you're seeing today, but the ones you may see uh, tomorrow or may not see tomorrow because the landscape has changed. The plants along it have changed. The plant communities have changed. Uh, so it's, I think it's uh, uh, an, an effort to get over our plant blindness, have a little more slowly, uh, uh, look around instead of just uh, 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 keeping track of where you've, uh, you're, you're going. Look around you along the way. You'll see lots of things along the way. Thanks very much. I'll take some questions or comments. Or Yeah, in the back. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. There are lots of plants I didn't talk about, too. So. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, there you go. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in trying to find uh, the nearest stand of river birch to Ames for mm -hmm. uh, targeting for syrup production. How how big a when you're talking a stand, you're talking about regular along the river. I think you'd have to fifty to fifty to hundred trees. To do um, you'd have to go southeast of here. There are occasional river birch along the skunk. You'll see them. Um, but in southeastern Iowa, where the skunk goes farther, I would say probably 60, 70 miles southeast of here, you'll begin to see them very commonly along the rivers. They're along the skunk, the Iowa, um, uh, the cedar, um, but all in the southeastern quarter of the state. And uh, I would say maybe the southeastern, the, the, the southeastern quarter of the southeastern quarter, okay, especially. That's where the most common. So, yeah. yeah. So, follow the skunk and just keep going farther south, past Chichaqua. And so, there are a few at Chichaqua, in fact. So, yeah. Somebody else Question? had their hand up. Uh, yeah, another one. Okay, good. He's, he's got to wait for the mic. Okay. Uh, with what you know about plants uh, and the disturbances that we have, are there any uh, rare conservative species that have surprised you that can either take advantage of these adapt these situations that we have, things that, like, oh, man, I, these mud flats are doing this, or, um, yeah, yeah. I think the most surprising ones are, are the ones where it's been restored, like on the Winnebago, uh, where it's not dominated by reeds canary grass. It's dominated by lots of sedges. It has it has scurpus, lots of of, 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 of bulrush. It has uh, spartina, that that uh, cord grass. Um, uh, it's where I find that variety, that diversity in plant species, that the river is the healthiest, and and the river's edge are the healthiest. You know, we've 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 um, disregarded our rivers and and taken uh, taken them for granted for you know, centuries in, in Iowa since since uh, we, we uh, uh, Euro-Americans settled here. And and uh, we use them as sewers, basically, for, for decades. And it hasn't actually, it wasn't until uh, the first Clean Water Act uh, started to be passed in 1948, and then the better Clean Water Acts, uh, or additional Clean Water Acts, passed in 72 and beyond, that we really started to clean it up our acts. When I was a senior in high school, I, I, the summer after our senior year, I worked at the, the secondary sewage treatment plant in Burlington for my summer job, and uh, which is quite fortuitous, actually, because it taught me a lot about sewage treatment, taught me not to swim south of the outfall, okay? <laughs> and, you know, I, it, I did that occasionally, and it hasn't affected me a bit, so... <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, the the uh, uh, working in the sewage treatment plant, uh, and I realized that that was that was that plant was very experimental at the time, and and it was new. Uh, it was one of the first secondary sewage treatment plants along the river, some of the oldest cities along the river. But when we had uh, a one-inch rain event in town, 
we had to close the, the gate and everything went directly into the river because our storm sewers and our sanitary sewers were the same system. And now, in the last couple of decades, those have been separated more and more. So now our sewage treatment plants can handle those big storm events because this, the storm sewers are separate from the sanitary sewer system. But uh, uh, it, it uh, was a good good lesson, uh, I think, you know, for me. So how did I get onto sewage treatment plants? I don't remember. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. In going quietly down the river, have you ever snuck up on any really tall, dark thing? <laughs> Several fishermen <laughs> were quite surprised to see me, especially after they woke up. You know, <laughs> you know fishing is one of those occupations that, that you do it for lots of reasons, not just for the fish. It's a great place to sit and contemplate your navel and and you know, uh, sleep in the sun and all those things. So, uh, what dark things were you uh, uh, thinking of? <laughs> You're thinking Bigfoot. No, I've not come across Bigfoot. I haven't come across Bigfoot. Uh, not yet. Not yet. I've still got a few rivers to paddle. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever run across a black bear or black bear tracks? I have uh, I've seen black uh, bear tracks in Iowa, black bear, uh, but I'm not along the rivers. I haven't haven't uh, I I don't inspect every beach along the way. I do pick up a lot of trash. In fact, Cindy, when she meets me at the uh, at the takeout in the evening, will say, "Ah, oh, here comes the garbage barge," you know. <laughs> so, and and uh, uh, I I found that ninety five percent of the beer cans that are out there are of two brands. Can you guess? <laughs> Bud Light and Bush Light. 95% <laughs> of them. There aren't a whole lot of craft beers uh, left out there for some reason, but uh, yeah, Bud Light and Bush Light. And, uh, uh, but no, um, um, uh, no, no Bigfoot. And uh, um, uh, yeah, they, they um, uh, what was your question? <laughs> Black bears, yeah, no black bears that I, I've se that I have seen, but I have seen tracks. Uh, wasn't on a beach, so it was in a in a cornfield, actually. So, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering if you wanted to talk just briefly about mussels and you know the that you've collected mm -hmm. along the way for research. Yeah, yeah, mussels are are quite fascinating. Many of them in Iowa are endangered, um, uh, and they've been become endangered for lots of reasons. One, we over, like many species, like most species, in fact, we overexploited them uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, so at the turn of the last century, um, the, the button factory down in Muscatine, that is now a button museum, uh, had, had piles of shells that had had buttons um, uh, made out of these uh, uh, Mississippi River mussels. Not only Mississippi, but also the Cedar and the Iowa and all those rivers that went to southeastern Iowa that I paddled as a kid um, uh, had mussels in them. Mussels disappeared for many of our reasons, of our, of our rivers, absolutely disappeared, in part because of overexploitation. Secondly, uh, because of dams. Uh, mussels, at a certain part of their life cycle, when they are in what's called the glochidia stage, it's like a larval stage, uh, the mussel... Uh, will implant its uh, glochidia into the gills of fish for a, a, from a few days to a few weeks, depending on the species. And if the fish can't travel upstream, neither can the clams. So if there's a dam in the way, uh, the mussels uh, cannot travel farther upstream and uh, um, end up, end up uh, uh, I, I, lots of times I've, 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 I've paddle above a dam, and you might notice this if you next time you paddle on a river with a dam and you you, you portage around the dam. Uh, on the upstream end of that, there would be nothing, not a single old mussel shell, no fresh mussel shells, well, the raccoons have eaten them, anything along the shoreline. Below the dam, all of a sudden, mussels everywhere. It tells me that dam is the thing that's stopping them. And it's all because of the life cycle of mussels uh, that need to be in the gills of fish. 
in order to travel upstream. So I think that's a hint. Uh, Diane got up. No, I, actually, actually, <laughs> actually, Jim, I had one com uh, one question of my own. Uh, any perspectives as far as all the miles you you paddle as far as agricultural land, agricultural impacts? impacts. Yeah. Uh, trending which way? Is it yeah. is it improving or is it are we still in a degradation? Because uh, we've we've done a lot, there's been a lot of effort in trying to improve improve riparian areas over the last 15, 20 years. Yeah, I, I think um from a chemical standpoint, we obviously from all the sampling that's going on all over the state. We still have, we have not reduced the nitrate uh, or phosphorus problem at all. Um, we're not, we're a long way from reducing it 45% by 2030. We've only got seven years left, folks, or eight years, okay, by 2030, uh, that we're supposed to reduce it, and we're not making it voluntarily. Um, I think most social problems, um, big problems that we as a society have faced, be they environmental or social or financial, have taken a combination of both voluntary efforts and involuntary regulations. I think we're going to need to have that uh, if we're going to solve this, this big environmental problem. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, uh, in many ways, though, it still depends on the river that you paddle. Some rivers, the landowners along it, and I have to tell you, the North Raccoon in Sac County, up into Buena Vista County, is a beautiful river. The landowners, it's almost all, uh, there, there's some public land along, it's almost all private land. It's a big, wide valley. Uh, it's, it's uh, has lots of savannas along it. Um, uh,